Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, an economist talks about why gender matters. Hawaiians teach us a little something about gender diversity. And I have a few thoughts on why the media discussion about all of this stinks. Welcome to the Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Conventional economic policy is gender blind, but what difference does a gender conscious lens make? When you look at markets, for example, what happens when you include the unpaid work that mostly women do of parenting and housework? What if we gave all that caring non-market work a value? What would happen to our understanding of market forces and the economy and what maybe would have to change. Pavlina Chernova is Associate Professor and Chair at the Department of Economics at Bard College. She's also a Research Associate at the Levi Economics Institute and a Senior Research Scholar at the Center for Full Employment and Price Stability. Can fiscal policy be feminist? I think she'd say it could. Pavlina, welcome to the program. So, so we'll get to feminist fiscal policy in just a minute. I couldn't resist the alliteration. But let's start with placing you in people's minds. People might know you as the author of the chart that Bernie Sanders took into Congress and that for a brief time was called the most important chart you'll ever see. Yes, it was uh, Twitter's fault. <laughs> I, I had done some research on really on fiscal policy and the impact uh, of fiscal policy on incomes. And I just found this stunning relationship looking at the Piketty inequality data. And um, I, uh, I asked a simple question, when the economy grows, who gains? And then when I looked at the Piketty data, it turns out that with every subsequent expansion in the post-war era, um, a smaller and smaller share of that growth went to the bottom 90% or even the bottom 99% mm -hmm. of households. The shift was extraordinary in the 70s, so much so that in this last expansion, all of the growth has gone to the top 1%. Um, so the vast majority of us are not actually feeling a, feeling a recovery because incomes are declining. And how have women fared in all of this? Uh, not too well. You know, it was it was funny because when the recession hit, it was dubbed man session. That's right. And the reason was because the unemployment rate of men accelerated a little faster than women. Usually unemployment rates are pretty comparable. Actually, women are slightly more um, underemployed, which is basically an expanded uh, way of looking at unemployment when you look at precarious work, et cetera. But during the recession, uh, both male and female unemployment rates shot up, um, men's a little faster. But when the recovery came, men's unemployment rates started declining and women's unemployment rate plateaued. Mm. So um, yeah, there is a very clear dimension to these economic problems. Uh, women tend to work more precarious jobs. They, uh, not only that there is a pay gap, uh, we know that well, but they tend to work more part-time jobs, more poor, poorly paid jobs, um, and they experience uh, more poverty. So can fiscal policy make any difference, make any impact on all of that? It certainly can. Fiscal policy can make great difference so, on So just many for fronts. the sake of, of many of us, Clarify what we exactly mean when we say fiscal policy. There was a legislator recently, I think in Minnesota, who actually passed a resolution saying that that <laughs> assembly, that the legislature was required to use the word fiscal and not physical. That's right, exactly. Because they were clearly confused. So Most in case anybody <laughs> from that legislature yes. is watching, That's right. lay it out for us. That's right. So fiscal policy usually refers to any act of Congress. Um, that deals with the management of the economy. So when we Congress gets together and passes budgets for X, Y, and Z, that is fiscal policy. Uh, whether we pass uh, uh, budgets for uh, various uh, tax incentives, whether they're various expenditure programs, whether they're tax cuts, subsidies, all of those fall under the purview of the fiscal arm of government. That is as opposed to monetary policy, which is conducted by the Fed and largely deals with interest rates so changes. So can fiscal policy be feminist? It can, it certainly can be feminist. I mean, um, every policy has important gender dimensions. And the reason is because economic 
problems are disproportionately um, uh, felt by different groups. So, uh, you know, when we talk about fiscal policy, it's such a general term. Um, we we think in these very aggregate terms that uh, if only government were to spend uh, or cut taxes, mm -hmm. somehow growth will. Uh, bring shared prosperity, but that's not really the reality. Economic problems are concentrated, um, uh, usually at the bottom of the income distribution. Uh, people with low incomes experience greater poverty, greater unemployment, gr greater you know, precarious um, labor market conditions, and women and minorities are uh, disproportionately affected so by these problems. So you need policy solutions that also target specific groups differently, right? Right, correct. So when we have a an understanding of how women fare in the economy, then our policies will be better targeted to their specific problems. Um, so, you know, one way, for example, to look at uh, the recovery is uh, to see who has fared uh, well. You know, the unemployment rate is almost as low as it was uh, prior to the Great Recession. Which but Democrats are claiming is a great victory. Is a great victory, exactly. But concentrated poverty has doubled over the last 10 years, meaning that um, twice as many people live in neighborhoods of extreme po poverty as compared to 10 years ago. That number hasn't changed mm. since the peak of the crisis. And obviously when people stop looking for work, they stop showing up in those unemployment numbers, right? Exactly. exactly. So talk a bit about how a feminist lens affects the bigger picture. So, so I'm hearing that we need policy that looks at the specific conditions of different groups because it's not just one differentiated economy out there. Um, but with respect to sort of economic theory, mm -hmm. start perhaps with that question of markets. What mm -hmm. difference does it make to have a gender conscious approach? Yeah. So when we talk about the market mechanism or how economies work, economists use uh, this euphemism, the representative agent, and of course there is no such thing. And what we need to um, to do is to bring specific analytic categories in our study understanding of markets. And those will include race, they will include gender, they will include class. Without explicit articulation of those analytic categories, we can theorize, number one. And then number two, we're not going to study the problems that are disproportionately experienced by low income groups, people of color, and women. So the first thing at the level of theory and at policy is to acknowledge and recognize that these are important groups that need to be studied. Then from the perspective of how you design policy, they can be um, gender aware policies. I mean, this, is, this has been recognized, I think, by um, at least some international groups who um, advocate gender um, aware budgets, for example. Like, what would it mean to design a congressional budget or to design public policy that specifically targets women, children, unpaid care burdens, all of the uh, problems that are normally mm. um, uh, born by, by women. But we don't do that families. here? We don't. We don't have gender aware budgeting in the United States. And countries like India do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in the US, we don't have this kind of uh, conversation. And it's very interesting because the United States, for example, is one of three countries in the world that doesn't have paid family leave. Mm -hmm. We are with Papua New Guinea, I believe, and Lesotho, I believe those are the other two, are the only country that doesn't, ha doesn't have federally mandated family leave. What this means, of course, in the context of, you know, we don't have public health care, we don't have all the other kind of social safety nets that we've come to know uh, present in Europe. So we, we, we have a more, um, I would say, uh, greater challenges. Families here in the United States are facing greater, greater challenges in participating in the labor market, supporting their families, and responding to um, emergency situations like care for children or elderly, which are again disproportionately done by mm. women. So that takes me to the question of, of markets again, because I'm very struck by the metaphorical implications of, well, if you look at the fact that some labor is actually not market-driven, it's care-driven, that might change our equation. Um, 
but there are very concrete ramifications of counting that unpaid labor too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the feminist literature, um, you know, there's uh, a clear recognition that taking care of children is a very important um, input, if you will, to uh, a support mechanism to the market system. And the fact that we can um, uh, educate our kids, take good care of them at home, means that they will become you know, better workers in the, in the workplace. And this is investment by families that is not recognized by public policy, but it is a clear benefit to the market, the so-called market. So you know, public policy usually is, is driven by several, should be driven by several recognitions. The first, you know, we need to provide for children and families. As a, as a basic human right. Morally correct. Morally the right thing to do. We need to provide the kind of safety nets that permit people to make the choices to work or not to work, how to work, whether to educate themselves or their kids on the right basis. If you have a, a good safety net that allows you to make um, this choice, this decision, then um, the decisions are not in, under duress, if you will. Right. A woman shouldn't be deciding, well, I don't have time to ch look after my child. I could make more money for the household by working, exactly. so I won't feed my kid this week. Pre precisely. Or, um, you know, for example, you will notice that um, in the U.S., women's participation in the labor market varies with the number of children. For men, that's not the case. You could have four children, but participation is very stable. The reason is because women take care of, of children generally at, at home. And when we have um, a relatively uh, inadequate uh, system of childcare education, you know, daycare, and, and also mother-friendly jobs that give flexibility in the workplace, et cetera, then it's no surprise that women have to make this choice. So two things. One, on the Republican side, you have Donald Trump and others saying, you know, there is um, downward pressure on, on wages ever since women entered the workforce because there's more workers. Uh, there's other downward pressures, too, he would say, immigrants and so on. Um, if you, you have to let markets run their course. So um, that's something you can really do. Women entering the force is what's brought wages down. Uh, what's your answer to that? And then secondly, I want to hear what your economic plan would be for the man who took your chart to Congress, namely Bernie Sanders. <laughs> um, well, the first thing is that uh, this idea that markets are going to sort out our economic problems is clearly nonsense. It has, you know, we have had plenty, you know, decades of market-friendly policies. We have not solved our most pressing economic problems, and in fact, they have gotten worse. So the empirical reality is 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 very clear. Also, the notion that pushing wages down um, increases employment is another uh, another sort of um, ideological position. We know that this is not true. In fact, it actually is, uh, probably creates more uh, precarious income conditions for families, inducing them to seek more employment, right? They have to find another job when they see their overall incomes uh, uh, fall. So no, markets, um, you know, we don't need to accept poverty wages, right, for markets or for firms to be happy to employ the desperate. Right? We need to provide alternative policies. So I've been working on, uh, uh, proposals that deal precisely with the problem of unemployment. You will find that poverty, destitution, crime, uh, virtually every socioeconomic problem that we face, environmental problem uh, in part, is due to um, large-scale uh, unemployment, long-term unemployment. So what right? do we do about it? And so this has to be the target of policy, direct, you know, our our policy has to focus directly on unemployment. Usually we think of growth we think of these other things. Um, let's just uh, recover. Let investment. Re let us restore investment, competitiveness, productivity, growth, on and on and on. Employment is always considered some sort of result of right. all of these things. Trickle down. Um, but then, of course, policy doesn't produce full employment. So now we have accepted the reality of jobless growth. Well we need to do precisely the opposite. So what would we do? The focus has to be on full employment. And we need direct targeted policies. And by this, I mean really just giving people jobs. Now, could that be jobs inside the home? Where do you stand on paid childcare? Well, uh, certainly paid part paid of domestic it, work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, direct employment would recognize the work that women do within the household. And 
there are various ways in which we can do that. One is quite simply to provide a universal child allowance, which pays women for their care at home. You will also find that um, women actually want jobs. They don't just want handouts. So uh, for those who choose to stay at home, uh, universal child allowance or some sort of income support will be absolutely essential. But for those women who want to work, there has to be an opportunity a guaranteed opportunity that it will be there, that it will be mother friendly, and that it will provide basic decent income. And so, you know, my approach to direct job creation, which would be um, essentially to guarantee an opportunity for those who want it um, in the public sector um, at a decent pay, men or women. And what about Hillary Clinton? I mean, she's the one that's talking about paid child care, I mean, paid um, parental leave, and talks about child care. I mean, she's running as the women's candidate, for better or worse? Certainly. I mean, there are, you know, there are um, uh, mother-friendly policies in her uh, proposals as well. And they are also um, uh, policies that uh, sort of push through the market mechanism. They attempt to work through the market mechanism through incentives. There's nothing wrong with, with attempting to do that. But unless we quite literally guarantee an employment opportunity to all, it's not going to happen. The, f the private sector will have only so many incentives to employ only so many people. And the way the private sector works, it employs the employable first. Like if you look at just how you know, firms poach each other for good employees and workers, um, and you have to have an extraordinary amount of stimulus to get to the very mm. bottom of the people mm. the, who actually need the jobs and to you know, climb the economic ladder and uh, find a, a decent economic opportunity. It's great talking to you. Thank you so much. We could keep going for ages. You Thank can find you. out more about our guest at our website. She's an associate professor and chair of the Department of Economics at Bard University in New York. Thanks so much for coming in. It was great to be here. Native Hawaiians have a lot to teach us about our limited approach to gender diversity. Dean Hammer and Joe Wilson a couple of years ago produced a feature on exactly that. Now they are releasing a curriculum in connection with their film, A Place in the Middle. Here's a look. Sometimes school says, oh yeah, I have more kana inside than most of the kana. And some kana have more wahine than the wahine. Some people don't accept it. They tease about it. But I wouldn't care at all. Because I'm myself, uh, other people are themselves. I was born in Hawaii 11 years ago, but my ancestors have been here for centuries. They came on big voyaging canoes over thousands of miles of ocean. Despite their isolation, they built up an amazing civilization with its own language and culture and philosophy. Hawaii has changed a lot since then, and many of the old ways have been forgotten. But there are still a few places that are trying to keep the ancient traditions alive. This is one of them, my school. I know it doesn't look like much, but for me, it's a very special place. That's me, and that's our teacher, cool me. That's the old me, before the transition. <laughs> When I was in high school, I had a very rough time. I was teased and tormented for being too girlish. But I found refuge in being Hawaiian, being Kanaka Maoli. My purpose in this lifetime is to pass on the true meaning of aloha, love, honor, and respect. It's a responsibility 
that I take very seriously. This is a cultural icon in Hawaii. Do you guys all understand? Hina is trying to hold on to what is left of Hawaiian culture. To say the word kumu means what? But what does it mean? If you say aloha to anybody, where is it coming from? Your mouth? Supposed to be. Or don't say the word. When you sing Hawaii Pono E, what flag do you have on your chest? Hi, Hawaii. We didn't get to sing that stuff in our schools. We had to pledge allegiance to the flag that took over Hawaii. Do you get it? There's a reason you were born in Hawaii or came home to Hawaii. There's some reason. It's divine energy that runs up through the lava. Do you guys get it? You are the warriors of today. Before the coming of foreigners to our islands, we Hawaiians lived in aloha, in harmony with the land and with one another. Every person had their role in society, whether male, female, or mahu. Those who embraced both the feminine and masculine traits that are embodied within each and every one of us. Mahu were valued and respected as caretakers, healers, and teachers of ancient traditions. We passed on sacred knowledge from one generation to the next through hula, chant, and other forms of wisdom. When American missionaries arrived in the 1800s, they were shocked and infuriated by these practices and did everything they could to abolish them. They condemned our hula and chant as immoral. They outlawed our language and they imposed their religious strictures across our lands. But we Hawaiians are a steadfast and resilient people. And so, despite 200 years of colonization and repression, we are still here. A Place in the Middle was directed and produced by Dean Hammer and Joe Wilson. You can learn more about their movie and Hawaiian approaches to diversity, the true meaning of aloha, and more at aplaceinthemiddle.org. You can also find out more about the film and that curriculum. Race and gender matter. A quick glance at the headlines tells you that much. Unfortunately, if you were to judge from the mainstream media coverage, they seem to matter most to candidates and their chances at winning the race for the White House. Take a recent front page story on the first presidential debate. Beneath the headline, Rifts on Race and Gender Frame Debate, a New York Times piece began, quote, Hillary Clinton and Donald J. Trump are spoiling for an extraordinary clash over race and gender, the cultural issues that are convulsing the nation. All that rifting, spoiling, and convulsing is enough to make anyone queasy. But what is really at stake? The Economic Policy Institute reported recently that three decades of simply hoping discrimination would fix itself haven't. Even adjusting for educational achievement, life experience, and place of residence, black women, for example, are earning worse than a third less than white men. And black men over 22% less. In fact, the black-white income gap is as bad as it was when Ronald Reagan took office. Well, who's to blame? Well, EPI blames discrimination and bad data, but also years of inaction by the Fed. Productivity has surged. For 30 years, Americans have been producing more and being paid less. And that's across all income groups. No one is getting what they're worth. To combat the wage gap, the EPI calls for more transparency and accountability in hiring, more collective bargaining, but they also talk big put picture. 
for action by the Federal Reserve on increasing wages and employment in step with productivity. They call for firm goals. Now, the illusion embraced by 43% of Trump voters, apparently, is that whites are losing out because of preferences for blacks and Hispanics. It's not only untrue. The truth is, what lifts the pressure off African Americans lifts everyone's boat. Race and gender matter. And not just for presidential candidates, as it turns out. But as long as the words only appear in connection with rift, spoil, or convulse, why would any of us want to talk about that? More information at lauraflanders.com. And write to me. Tell me what you think. That's Laura, L-E-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And thanks.